Good morning, everybody from Chile Dubuque. I am Becky Heil, and it is my pleasure to introduce you today to our morning keynote speaker, Cindy Fessmeyer. Cindy's complete bio can be found on the State Library of Iowa website on the iLock page, so I'm not going to repeat all of it here, but I'd like to encourage you to take a second to read it at some point. I was particularly taken by her commitment to small and rural libraries, as well as her passion for placing libraries at the center of their communities, as evident by the title of her address, From Community Potlucks to City Planning. Please welcome Cindy Fessmeyer. Thanks so much, Becky and Sam, and thanks for having me here today. I'll be with you off and on throughout the day, but I'm really excited particularly to be um, working with you all and presenting to a conference that's entitled Make Room for Yes. I feel like that sort of describes my experience as a library professional. So before I start sharing my screen, I was just going to let you know a little bit about me and, and how I, I got to be here as your keynote today. Uh, so I began in, well, you know, my, my professional career began in nonprofits, and I did that for 14 years, got burnt out, went to library school here in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I'm coming to you from today. It would have been a short drive to get to you in person, but um, I'm really happy to be able to do it virtually on a cold day like this today. Uh, right after library school, I took a position as the director of the uh, small rural Columbus Public Library in Wisconsin. That's why it's rural. Um, and you're gonna hear a whole lot about Columbus in our time together shortly. But I'll just say after seven years there, I went on to be the adult and community services consultant for the Wisconsin State Library. And that's how I got to know Sam and ultimately Becky and other folks in Iowa. So um, thank you for having me. At this point, I am simply an independent consultant and I work from home with cozy socks on every day, um, though I pick coffee over hot cocoa. So I'm going to just need a minute to uh, set up my screen and you're going to see the presenter view to begin because there we go. Sam or Becky, are you seeing the correct screen now? Yes, we are. It looks great. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'll just say that um, you all are very welcome to enter items into chat along the way to um, you know, participate, to say a little something back, or to ask questions. And uh, it's fine with me to um, have Sam or, or Becky interrupt with your questions, but also you can just keep track of them and ask them at the end. We should have plenty of time for that by then. And um, yeah, here we go. So like I said, I got out of library school and literally, I think within days, got this lovely position in Columbus, Wisconsin. So I wanna tell you about that for a moment. So the Columbus Public Library is um, serving a municipal population of about 5,000 people. Now here in Wisconsin, that qualifies as a city. So let's just stick with that and, and call it a city and know that, but do please know that um, it's, it's small and rural. It feels like a town. Uh, I just want to let you know that, but I'll be calling it a city throughout. So um, Columbus is an interesting place. I served the 5,000 people-ish who lived in the city itself and then another 10,000 in the small farming communities around it. And I know many of you can relate to that. And Columbus is about... Um, 25 miles northeast of Madison, Wisconsin, where I live and where I continued to live as the library director there. So Madison is the seat of the biggest university in the state. It's the seat of state government, and it's known as a very liberal um, sort of bastion of, of professionals, and that's how the state views Madison, um, sort of like Madison sometimes from the rest of the state. So I came in with my big um, city goggles on kind of, and I realized that Columbus is a municipality just steeped in, in tradition. It's a, um, it, it's a heavily agricultural place and the same 
last names are repeated. It's the same like five families who do much of the moving and shaking. So it's like deeply traditional and very proud of that. However, you heard me say it's just 25 miles northeast of Madison. Madison's getting increasingly expensive. So people are looking for places to be able to buy a bigger house with more land and um, a place that feels safe to them, that kind of thing. Columbus is definitely on the map and absolutely has transformed into a bedroom community at this point. There's still lots of farm farm fields in between the two, but many, many people trans uh, end up commuting from Columbus down to Madison for their day job. I was doing the reverse commute. Consequently, though, the people who had sort of relocated from the Madison area up to Columbus um, had a certain standard that they expected in their library. And on this slide, you see um, the traditional library, the old view, the innovation um, bit there, that's the, the flagship Madison Public Library that's located downtown. And then right in the middle is that kind of modern day take of what the Columbus Public Library looked like. So then I step in, they hire me as a director after having had a director, the same director for like 25 years or something. So I was really, oh, I don't know, I didn't know what I was stepping into you. And those of you who've taken leadership positions in your libraries, you know what that feels like to follow somebody who uh, sort of left big shoes for you to fill. So in addition to that, I was also new to the town, an outsider, particularly when people found out that I was never intending to move to Columbus. My husband's work was in Madison. My children were firmly ensconced in a good public school in Madison. I had no intention of uprooting them for the job. So. I didn't start on the strongest possible foot in trying to fill those big shoes. Something that I knew I needed to do right away though was to get to know the community. And, and I wanted a way to like fast forward and get to do that quickly. Now I'm not naturally an extrovert. Um, I, I would have much rather sort of sat in my office and like Google the town and, and believe me, I did plenty of that, but I also knew that I just needed to get out there and meet people. I had the, uh, the happy background of having been a fundraiser for a lot of years where I had to kind of get over that shyness and, and just get used to talking to people. So I leveraged that a little bit and was really lucky along the way to find an opportunity to apply for uh, an ALA pro program called Libraries Transforming Communities, LTC. That's what's on the slide here. It was um, a, a grant opportunity for 10 libraries across the country to be able to receive a year's worth of training from the Harwood Institute. And uh, it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in addition to that training um, from Harwood, we ended up having a really tight cohort of learners. We got a little bit of grant money to spend on a project within our community. But what I really wanted to do was learn how to be um, sort of innovated and externally focused so that I could get to know the community better more quickly. And that this program is how I intended to fast forward into that. So this is the team that I sent. Each of those 10 libraries sent five people. Now in a, in a small library, that's really hard to pull together because um, the entire staff was like, like 10 people for like about five and a half FTE, which here in, in Wisconsin is considered a medium sized library, but is certainly small by national standards. So on this kind of picture, you can see me in the background and to um, what is my left was my youth services director. She was the other full-time person from the library who went through this training with me. And when we went to Denver for the initial training, it was everything we could do to keep the library doors open. So I knew I couldn't bring more staff into it. The the short woman in front, um, Mary Lou Sharpie, was a board member for the, or like a library trustee. She was involved in the Literacy Council. She was just an all around mover and shaker in town. She joined our effort. The woman to my right in the photo um, is Sean Brummer, and she was with the library system that we're in, associated with, that the Columbus Library was associated with. Um, libraries are required to be in a system. And the only guy in the photo is Bruce Smith, who was with a national, or, I'm sorry, a statewide organization in Wisconsin called WILS, Wisconsin Library Services. And you see, I needed to sort of reach um, into my community, into my library system, and somebody in the state to be able to fill out five people, because that's a, that's a 
long haul for uh, a small library to be able to do that, but I was very happy to be able to do that. We got the grant and we went to Denver for our first training. There we met uh, a bunch of people from other libraries. So 10 libraries with, with five people each, it was 50 people. And you can see these are by the columns, sort of in the order of how big the libraries were. You can see that Columbus was the second smallest, um, truly rural, along with the Red Hook Public Library in New York, all the way down to San Jose and Los Angeles in California that served like you know, millions of people where I was really stoked that we served 5,000 people. So it, there was a big disparity in how we were learning, but I have to tell you, the people that I found um, the most, like the tightest relationship with out of this cohort of people were the ones who were in the smaller, more rural communities or in a bigger system that had lots of well-defined neighborhoods for their branches. And we were the ones who got the most pickup, really. We were the ones who could sort of have an idea and try a thing because there wasn't a whole lot of bureaucracy or, or hoop jumping that we had to do in order to try something out in our municipalities. So even though I felt like a small fish in a big pond when we got started here, after about a year of the work, I realized that we had a leg up on like Los Angeles or San Jose because I could just have an idea and try something. And I hope that many of you feel like you're in that same position within your community because that's a really strong place to be and um, an easy place to be to say the word yes in keeping with the theme of today's conference. So my Harwood experience really taught me that um, turning outward, and that's their phrase, the Harwood says to turn outward, that it's really important. And I used it as sort of a guide star as I was learning the new skill set from, how, from Harwood. And what that means to them, it's the act of um, seeing and especially hearing the community uh, that surrounds the library and to be in tune with that so that together you can create change. They consider it a reorientation toward the public, like sort of away from the inside of your library and out. And for me, I took that very literally and uh, actually changed the orientation of my desk within my office from looking at a wall to looking out a window. And that helped me you know, see people walk by and cars go by and people go into the post office and really just um, remember that we were part of a whole community. And then ultimately that change in mindset for me brought me down to being able to use that community sentiment to make choices about how the library took its position within the community. So turning outward was a, a sort of a incremental little by little change of mindset really that the library held in relation to the community it served. So the big thing with the, the Harwood turning outward thing is like I just said, it's where you filter your opportunities and challenges within your library through the lens of the community not just the library, although the library matters, but in order to really serve the needs of the folks that that live around the library, you need to know what they want. So you have to ask them things. And that's the, the taking measure is to just be listening, get out there, go to meetings, um, help organize stuff, but, but always keep tuned in to listen to what people are really saying. It also means that um, you need to sort of change the process that, that you use to make decisions about library programming or your focus for the coming year or strategic planning. For me, it also meant not being shy about being proactive when a community issue really burbled up to the top that the library could potentially take a hand in. And that's what the rest of uh, this, this little talk is gonna be about this, this morning. And so to my mind, what that meant is that I put the wants and needs and aspirations of the community before all else. When a new opportunity came our way or we were considering what our summer reading program was going to look like, we always eventually together as a team started with the community and what are we hearing out there. So we put them first before us. 
So just in a nutshell, and you will have these slides available to you. So obviously these aren't um, live links for you on, on your screen right now, but you'll have access to them. Harwood has a whole bunch of different tools and perhaps you've heard of the Harwood Institute and theirs is just one brand or, or one toolbox of different ways to <clears throat> connect with your library, sort of like different recipes on how you might approach people. I had three favorite things and in order of sort of like short and easy to uh, harder and longer, they go to the ask exercise, the aspirations exercise and community conversations. I invite you on your own time to click through those and take a look. The ask exercise is just four questions and we used it as a person on the street questionnaire where I printed them off and friends of the library or, or staff would be out and about during library events or community music events or whatever and ask these questions of folks on the street. That's a really good way to hear from people who don't necessarily come into your library often, if, if ever, by the way, is these person on the street interviews. That little library, Red Hook, New York, that was even smaller than us in the cohort, um, their deputy mayor was part of their bunch of five people uh, that got trained in this work. And they came from a community of fewer than 2,000 people in population, like 800-ish residences. They knocked on every single door with these questionnaires. So there are different ways to deploy them. The aspirations exercise I used with the library board just to get them in the mood of what the Harwood stuff felt like. And community conversations became a way to deeply engage with the community um, with a curated set of 10 questions that really logically walk you through sort of um, brainstorming and troubleshooting toward looking at outcomes together. I find that to be a very powerful tool. The other thing that I would recommend to you is in addition to the things that Harwood or any kind of community engagement toolbox that, that you like, in addition to those things that they lay out there, be a little creative and think about your community. So in Columbus, we are the or, or the, they are the redbud city and redbud are those little pinky purple trees that you see on the slide uh, those are, you probably have them there and there is one called a columbus strain of the redwood so uh, they take great pride in that and so trees are everywhere and in the springtime when they blossom it's fantastic so i knew that was something that i could capitalize on for us um, so I invite you to think about your community and you might think of like school mascots. So if I were in Madison, we have Bucky Badger and um, maybe that's something I would take advantage of. Or if you have some, some annual events that happen, just what is your town known for? And you can kind of build that into whatever your effort is. So what that looked like for us in Columbus was a thing we named at the very beginning, the Root for Columbus campaign. And this was just one more way that we collected community sentiment so that um, we could give the people what they want because we had asked them what they want. So we created two different trees. In the upper right-hand corner picture, it's literally like the, the tree itself that's on those glass doors is made out of like cut up grocery bags. And then people on the leaves themselves would have the opportunity to write an answer to the question, what kind of community do you want? And they could stick them up on the tree that lived in the library. In conjunction with the Department of Public Works, we also found a, a scrubby little ditch tree, cut it down, stuck it in a Christmas tree stand and moved it around maybe 10 or 12 different locations in the in the community over the course of a couple of months um, and asked people to answer that same question, what kind of community do you want? And they wrote it on those little green and yellow tags and hung them in lieu of trees. And I'll tell you, we collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these leaves and ended up with some really interesting data that became quantitative because we had so much of it. It was sort of numbers driven. Um, and we could see that, you know, 60% of the people like this theme. So I invite you to get a little bit creative when you think about ways to engage. This was a really easy way to do it. And it brought a lot of attention on the library because like trees showed up in bank lobbies and at the stop and go and at the school, the one here in the lower right hand is in the elementary school. Um, and those were some fun leaves to read, I'll tell you. 
So let me tell you what we heard. We asked people what they wanted through these variety of means, and we were trained by ALA and the Harwood Institute to do that. You don't need training to do that. You can just start asking and taking part if you're not already. But after asking, we themed out everything that we heard. And what we heard is that Columbus wanted to be a welcoming and vibrant community for all. Because it was becoming a bedroom community, it was a little like people didn't really do stuff in the evening because they got home from work and they needed to feed their kids or take their dog for a walk and just wanted to like kick, kick back and chill. They didn't really want to get involved in the community. And Columbus wanted that. They wanted to welcome people into that. They wanted people to not just um, get involved at the one faith institution they intended, they attended, or the one restaurant that they usually eat at, or the one bar that they usually drink at. They wanted people to, to do different stuff besides that and to feel a little bit of pride. It was also particularly interesting to hear, um, and it, it, as part of that community conversation sort of process, it was, and who do you trust in the community to help us realize this cool aspiration we all just came up with together. And almost all the time, it was dead silence. So it was notable that there was no like organization or individual who rose to the top as somebody trusted to move and shake and make some change. So in response to what we heard, we knew that we needed to raise up some community leaders. And we did just that. And we fumbled a little bit, but we did our best, we got started. Um, the best thing to do to get yourself started is to just do the first thing and start walking down that road. And it doesn't have to be the strongest first step that you take, you just need to start. And that's, that's how you get some inertia to get going. So for us, we just asked around and we got some folks to agree to uh, have an initial meeting to talk about Columbus. And they became citizen leaders. There's a link on this slide that you can go back to later. Later, That's a little bit of a ALA created this little like video case story about us where you can hear from some of those leaders who uh, got particularly involved with the Root for Columbus effort. So together, they brainstormed a way to make people feel that civic pride and to get involved and to sort of leave their homes and, and do stuff out in the community and with the community and for the community was to have a thing that we called the Root for Columbus Action Potluck. So the tree was called the Root for Columbus tree. And then we were done with that. But, but people started latching on to the phrase Root for Columbus. So we kept it, but we called it action in all capital letters because we wanted people to know the time for sharing your opinions for talking that's that's over for this program and now it's time to do something about it so together that group of citizens of leaders who we were raising up and library staff and the people from the harwood trained team created a thing called these potlucks so we got people together just like you see in the in the photo here and the library's role in it was simply to convene people, to um, bring them together, to provide the space. This was a, a shelter in a park that I was able to get for free because I was a city department. So I leveraged that relationship in order to not have to spend money. We created the agenda together with those citizen leaders. We um, trained people as facilitators to lead the chat. And we were sure to be as transparent and frequent with communication as we could be, because we all know that sort of marketing and just getting the word out is always a challenge. So the library committed to helping overcome that problem. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through what the potluck looked like, um, just so that you have an idea of what went into it. It wasn't just sort of show up with a dish and, and we'll do a little bit of chatting. It was very methodical and, and planned out. So a couple months before it even happened, that Root for Columbus leadership team planned themes and um, decided who the facilitators were going to be, who the greeters were going to be, who was going to sit at the different tables in order to keep conversation going and to take notes. We came up with a marketing plan, who was going to design something, how was it going to be released. That is something that the library, again, just convened those Root for Columbus leaders and um, helped them follow through on their commitments in putting, putting out this potluck program. And by the way, 
it was a program of the library. So every time we did one of these, I counted all the people in the room and it counted for a library program for our annual report statistics, by the way. So never forget to um, consider things that don't happen in the library, one of your programs. So I want to tell you about those themes. We had four default themes when things were just sort of coasting along. The, the um, kind of affinity tables that we would have at the potlucks were about whole communities, environment, art, and families. And people would self-select and sit. So in the photo here, you see um, some of the local creative folks in Columbus coming together to work up a small community project that had to do something with the theme of art. But we were also tuned in to what was going on in the community. And sometimes our themes were about that. So at one point we had had a, it wasn't tornadoes, but a crazy, crazy straight wind storm. And I know you know very well what that feels like being in the Midwest. Um, and the, sh the town was just shut down for a week. Like I, I literally was not allowed to drive in. The, the roads were, were shut. And people, as you know, um, they tend to come together when there's a tragedy or a trauma or something really dramatic happens. So neighbors got to know neighbors because um, one could haul wood while the other one used their chainsaw to cut tree limbs so that they could finally, you know, drive on their street or whatever. So people banded together. One of the themes was how, how can we keep that togetherness going. Another theme was um, what's a special thing we can do around holidays, whatever that holiday is. Um, Fourth of July was big, Christmas stuff was big, and then also summer. You know, the Midwest is a great place to be in the summertime, so we had some summer themes as well. On the day of the potluck, those um, greeters at the front door made sure to have people sign out their information on a contact sheet so we could get back in touch with them. Name tags are very important. If you think everybody in your town knows everybody else, you're wrong. Um, you might, some people might, but um, not everybody knows everybody. So name tags are very egalitarian. I love them. I use them all the time, or I used to when I saw people. Um, and we just sort of set up the room, put the, those little um, table tents on the tables for the affinity tables, uh, put, you can see we put poster board up at the top because there was a brainstorm on post-it notes part of the agenda, and then people would stick them on these themes. And then we uh, sort of kicked off our meetings by hearing how the projects had gone from the previous Route for Columbus Action Potluck. We did them every three or four months, and between potlucks, we did the projects. So you probably want to know, well, what does that look like? Well, this is how we planned those projects. So everybody, when they came in, got one of these planning guides. And um, along the left-hand side, those bullets tell you what things were on the planning guide. But I wanted to show you what one looks like. Uh, this actual planning guide was for the second time we uh, decided to do a park cleanup in Davies Park, which is right next to an Amtrak station. It was very much ignored and weedy, but should have been a lovely place to sit and wait for your train or to wait for your person to to come on the train and over years we transformed it in partnership with the department of public works a, a little bit um so that is kind of what it looked like it was it was messy when people filled it out but they walked away knowing what the project was what their part of the project was the name of the team leader and the team leader changed for every project so that different people took just a small commitment to leadership out of this. Um, for the next couple few months, you agree to be the leader in this one project working with these like six people. So it was a little bite-sized piece of leadership at the kind of civic engagement level. And that was very intentional on our part. And then people walked away with everyone's contact info so they could keep in touch and get their stuff done. These are some of the things that we did together. We did, oh, in, in that um, first slide about the potlucks, um, it looked like it was in a basement. Well, it was the in the basement of a park building that turned 100 during our, our time doing these potlucks. And so we had a community reminisce in it where ultimately a whole lot of older folks came together with a microphone so they could hear each other, shared their memories about that building. And they were cool things. And the awesome thing is a bunch of Boy Scouts were there to record it and interact. And it, it was a fun event. Um, we started an annual event called a chalk walk, just people decorated squares. It was a little competition. Um, this is just sidewalk chalk on sidewalks uh, around the downtown area. It took some volunteer time and buying some chalk, and that was about it. 
I mentioned the park cleanup. With the little bit of money we had back uh, left over from the grant that we got from ALA, we bought a bunch of blank park benches and invited uh, local artists, I think we did six of them, to decorate them. And this one here in the lower right hand corner was the art bench that the middle school did. They took photographs and decoupaged them to the bench. And ultimately, I put a little plaque on each of them that said, this bench is brought to you by the Root for Columbus effort of the Columbus Public Library to make sure people knew that the library was getting some cool stuff done. And the Gnomes Away From Home was just a little social media uh, treasure hunt kind of thing. The gnome moved around and you got clues, just something to do in the summer. So Root for Columbus started as a tree. It became that action potluck program. And ultimately, Root for Columbus got some legs and people would come into the library and say, Root for Columbus, what's up? How do I get involved? What's going on with Root for Columbus? What are your projects? And we realized that, uh, whoops, sorry about that, that I Root for Columbus was kind of becoming a little bit of a mantra for people who were finding a way to get involved with their community. So we had these yard signs made. Um, a tip from me to you, something I did very wrong. Nowhere on there does it say the library and it it should have had the library logo or a website or something so if you ever do anything like this be sure to take a little bit of credit for it on behalf of the library so i root for columbus just became a point of pride and anybody who had anything to do with any of those potlucks and and then those um community leaders they all put these out on their lawns or in their business windows or in their apartment window so they started popping up and uh, getting people talking a little bit so that was how we got to raise up leaders and um, take a little bit of pride in the community when we were in the beginning asking people what they wanted for their community we also heard that they wanted a viable walkable downtown. Columbus, like many small towns, was suffering from big box stores opening on the outskirts and not big box like Target, but big box like a big grocery store, not just the little mom and pop that used to be downtown, uh, things like that. And um, there were two groups that cared about the downtown. One was the Chamber of Commerce and one was a group called the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation, CDDC. But they, for like, decades sort of fought each other. And though they had the same goals in mind, they just couldn't work well together. And I'm sure it went way back to some personality difference and like people just didn't let it go. So we knew that people wanted this viable, you know, welcoming, cute downtown. But we also knew that the two main players who could help make that happen were not going to play well together. So kind of capitalizing on a very dramatic event that happened in town one summer, the main street um, that went through town and, you know, in smaller towns, there's a main street. Well, the main street was closed for, gosh, like seven or eight months to just reconstruct it. It was County Highway and it was our turn to, to have it fixed. But most of the small businesses in town were on this street, including the library and city hall. And we knew that that summer was going to be really challenging and wanted our businesses to stay in business and not because of loss of revenue end up closing. So what the library did was leverage that power to convene people, brought them together and had them talk. And that included members from the CDDC and the Chamber of Commerce. We got them to communicate through a process that looked an awful lot like that, um, that planning document that we used for the Route for Columbus um, action potlucks. And we helped raise up leaders within the business community who would take charge of those small things from, um, you know, maps and signage about where to park to um, joint coupon weekends or, or whatever. It was a very DIY approach to keeping keeping doors open of businesses. And the library simply brought people together and then agreed to be the one to sort of communicate to all parties that were involved. So it wasn't one group or the other taking the lead of those business groups. And um, we just supported their efforts to help themselves through that. As a byproduct of that, 
the business community got really used to working together. And so um, the Canadian Pacific train um, has a thing every holiday called the holiday train and it comes through Columbus, it stops there. And it used to be like a few hundred people would go out and, and watch the train drive through. Well, eventually the train stopped, open its doors and then like a rock band plays some songs and Santa Claus comes out. And we got to be one of those ones that got a stop and it like, thousands of people started coming eventually. And we saw that there was a opportunity for the business community to keep that juice going and to band together and offer different events to happen that evening as a warm up to the holiday train coming through at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, that was just their, their schedule in coming through municipalities. But a whole lot of different community partners came in on that. It wasn't just businesses and it wasn't just the library, but it was the Columbus Recreation, it was city tourism, lots of local businesses that weren't even associated with the Chamber of Commerce or the CDDC fire and police to help control crowds. The schools got involved selling things as fundraisers, hot cocoa to keep people warm, uh, different civic clubs got involved. It became a really big thing, but it was possible because two groups that hadn't got along were getting along and figured that, that when they <laughs> band together for good instead of not good, uh, they could get some stuff done in town. I'm really stoked to see that you guys get the holiday train coming through too. It's really fun. It's a fun night. Cold, but fun. So on one more theme, what we heard also was that Columbus wanted ways to interact socially. Um, they wanted more stuff for kids and teens to do, as you'll always hear over and over. But mostly they said that they needed like actual physical public spaces that didn't cost money to rent or use. They needed places to come together to like plan stuff, to um, work on something for their neighborhood or, or whatever it was, because they were starting to get used to working together and finding space to do that was difficult. There just wasn't a lot of public space in, in this town. So the library took that to heart. All this work that we were doing using the Harwood method and talking to people in the community and getting involved, all of the information that we gathered through the leaves on the Root for Columbus trees and the ask exercise and the aspirations exercise and the community conversations, we took all of that to inform our new strategic plan, which ended up with four goals about communication, programming, and being a welcoming environment. And you can see how those flow very well from what I've been talking about. But very importantly, um, in an in a old Carnegie library um, that turned 100 while I was there, and that uh, was the same 6,000 square feet that it had been for those whole 100 years, um, serving 15,000 people, it wasn't cutting it anymore. We only had one meeting room and um, realized that we wanted to be part of the solution in that lack of actual physical space to get together. So we took that seriously and put it into our strategic plan that we were going to strive to find multi-use space within the community or to provide it ourselves. We had the opportunity when the house next door came up for sale to raise private funds that were matched by city funds to buy that house. Real estate isn't terribly expensive in Columbus, so it was a stretch, but not crazy. And um, But that was it. That was all the money we had. So we needed to then do something with the house that ultimately they can expand in that area. Um, but in the meantime, we turned the house into a thing we called the library annex. And the first floor housed the Friends of the Library bookstore and became the home for a number of community partners, the Historical Society um, and Oh, the Redbud Players, a local theater, um, stored things in the basement of that house and practiced in the living room to get ready for plays. And then the upper level was not accessible. So we rented it very affordably to local artists. So there are um, four artists studios up there in exchange for very inexpensive rent. They agreed to either do a library program or two each year or to participate in some kind of public art effort um, each year. So it was a, a nice symbiotic relationship with artists and you saw that art was often a theme of our of our convenings when we did those potlucks so we liked the opportunity to keep that going so 
we had the library, which had a tiny meeting room. We had the annex, which was like a wonky, jiggered together space because it was really a house. And like the living room was a meeting room and the dining room was a bookstore. And uh, the literacy council used the sunroom. It was, it, it was goofy. It wasn't like a regular library. So we knew that we needed to strive for a library expansion or, or relocation and a new building, whatever it was. When we worked with the mayor, the, the city executive, the city council to do that, it was clear that they weren't ready to take a big leap like that and make a big investment in the community yet. They wanted a plan for how they were going to move forward. And to move forward when you're a small town, you have to think really far in advance because you don't have the money to do big things all at once. You have to plan for them. And so the library, in a very self-serving way, because the library wanted more space for itself so they could serve the community better. We decided to work with the city to give them what they needed, a plan for growth. What we did was um, all those players I just talked about came together. We created a, wait for it, a board of citizens of local residents to come together and do some planning with us. Together we um, with like local residents, they helped hire a planning consultant to help us do this long-term plan. And we created that plan um, throughout 2018 and 2019. We got that done. Ultimately, um, because I felt some confidence in having won that really big grant opportunity from ALA, the Libraries Transforming Communities one, I took a big chance and I asked applied for an IMLS national leadership grant. And oh my gosh, library staff and I worked on that for, oh, it was onerous. I'll say that much. Going for a national grant is tough, but we got it done because what it brought was 48,000 extra dollars to us. And of that, we gave $25,000 toward the $100,000 consultant fee for doing that, that visioning and planning process. And then the remainder we used to um, basically raise up a leader within the, the library, give her a promotion, have her be an assistant director who held held things going on the daily um, at the library so that I could spend a lot of time out of the, the library. And um, so that helped us raise up some more like staff leaders too within the library that was really had fantastic lasting effects. But ultimately the city hired that planning consultant. They worked with um, a band of, of local residents to take the lead on that and created a report called the Roadmap to 2050. It was a 30 year plan because that's how far in advance we had to think in order to assess municipal facilities and start planning for replacing or repairing them or expanding them like the library needed. So that was a really fast version of my, like about six years of my library directorship in Columbus. I just want to leave you with a few takeaways. So what I'm really saying is, although it may not be natural for you, um, get out of your library and start to learn what the community wants for itself. So you need to know what the community wants in order to be one of the people who, who helps give them that thing. So you need to ask questions and get zen with being someone who just asks a lot of questions, even if they seem stupid, and listen really closely and just, just kind of participate. As you're doing this though, you have to be really patient because I know every single one of you know Though most people have community good at their heart and that's what they really want, the process they choose to attain that community good isn't always the same for different people. So there are people who are kind of difficult, right? You just need to have patience and listen and uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I did a lot of that and, and get through it. And know too that, that planning change is hard for people. Um, people lived in Columbus because they liked the small town kind of old fashioned feel of it. So any kind of change was difficult for them. I had a little mantra for myself and it was change is hard. And it helped me as a natural change maker. I like change. I like to see what's coming next. I'm always looking forward, not back. Um, I had to repeat to myself in my head, change is hard, change is hard, just so I'd slow my roll and go with the pace of the community. Otherwise we'd lose them and I'd alienate them and they wouldn't care about the library anymore because we were 
trying to make too big of a change. So just go with the pace of the community, have patience, and then model positive behaviors. So when you're working with those difficult folks in a community conversation, um, just like patience with them and thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, let's hear from somebody else. Just, just model that. And, and for um, the library staff that you work with and the other people in your municipality and the people who live there, just be smiley and be a cheerleader. And if that doesn't come natural to you, fake it for real. You got to fake it till you make it. So a key to me, and this is what um, one of the breakout sessions following this is going to be about specifically, you could see the many, many partners that we worked with throughout this transformational process in Columbus, Wisconsin. And so that doesn't come easily. Like any relationship, it doesn't just happen overnight. Even if you stepped in a position where you inherited some strong partners with the library, you still have to work at keeping those partnerships going. It is ultimately a very personal thing to have organizations be close partners because people within those organizations have to overlap and connect. So keep that in mind. It takes some work to keep those partnerships strong. And when the resources you need in partners aren't um, readily available to you. Know that you can go to individual people who live in town and, and ask them to lead. It doesn't have to be like run for village council or anything big and scary and political. It can just be like, hey, would you just organize us for this couple months to clean up this park? Because I know you're a gardener and your expertise is exactly perfect. So ask people to participate in the change that you're trying to 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 do within the community. And I think ultimately you do the community a, a real service when you raise up more leaders who are actively involved with the community they live in. And then really importantly is to also empower the, the rest of your staff. So whether you're a library director or not, people need to um, have the opportunity to play to their strengths within the library, just like we rose up leaders within the community. We also rose up li library leaders and the staff dynamic changed a lot when people who were part-time library assistants were able to really take the lead on some efforts within the library or also within the community. Uh, it wasn't just I who attended rotary meetings every week. Uh, that was part of my big thing was to become a Rotarian. We switched. We had an organizational membership and we switched who got to go have that free lunch every week and represent the library. So so let, let leaders be raised up within your organization too. And here's a negative one. I don't say the negatives a lot, but we know change is hard, right? Because of that, grow a thick skin and try your best to let things just wash over you. And if you can, in fact, embrace being a change agent, being someone who is a cheerleader for, for positive change that ultimately helps people attain what they want, just know that not everybody appreciates that. Some people moved to that town because they wanted it to stay exactly like that. And you're messing with that dynamic. And so they hate you. Just know that can happen. Um, it's, it's hard, but um, make sure to counter that, that you have people in town or um, in your library or, I don't know, in the region of your state who are also change agents who are doing this hard work. And for me, it was a couple of women from that original ALA Libraries Transforming Communities Harwood cohort. A couple of them and I became like, like professional best friends. And we very often, like at least once a month would have phone calls because Zoom wasn't really a thing then, but we would have phone calls and just share our trials and tribulations and our, and our, our triumphs together as well and support each other and be each other's cheerleaders. I found that helped a lot to counter the negativity that I got sometimes out of the community itself where I was trying to work that change. And then in keeping with the theme of the conference and really all I just was saying over these many, many minutes that I've been just talking at you is just say yes, find a way to say yes. And let that be your default. And you can't necessarily agree to do everything. So maybe sometimes it's yes and 
to do that thing you just said, might I introduce you to somebody else who can help you with that? And that's all it takes is for you to make a call or send an email to say yes to that person, but ultimately sort of ditch them off to somebody else. But you said yes. And I think it's very important to lead your interactions with your community, with the other staff at your library, with people who work at the municipality, with people who live there, with yes. So they get used to that default from you. And I found a lot of strength in sort of changing my approach and leading with that positive response to anything that was happening. So yes, make room for yes is the takeaway here. I can see that the chat has been going crazy and I haven't been monitoring it at all, Sam. So I'll leave it to you for questions. I don't even know what time we have for questions. But in the meantime, um, you'll get with the slides these three links to some of the ALA resources. They're all free. This photo was um, me and those two librarian besties that I mentioned and some other folks from the ALA program. We gave a program at PLA in 2016 and we packed the house. It was the first time any of us gave the program gave a program ever at a national conference and it felt really good so we took a selfie with the big crowd in the background so we had some like professional national success as well and I thought I'd end with that and now let's read a silly meme and have some questions. Thank you Cindy. Um, one question that came through sort of at the end here I'll go back and sort of summarize this for you. Um, Stacy and Alta Vista got one of the LTC Transforming Community Grants and um, she has just started at the library. The former director got the grant and they did a program and they only had a few people attend. So she wondered if you have any advice on how do you make, um, make that more central so that you could get more, more attendance at that. Well, first I wanna say yes and you got a few people to attend and, and that's really terrific. So take some pride in that and take a moment to celebrate the fact that in these ridiculous times, you got people to still participate. So celebrate that. And those people who participated, they care. So you're now connected to some folks who care. Um, in library land, we're so obsessed with the numbers of people who walk through our doors, check out our materials, attend our programs. If you can de-emphasize that a little bit, honestly, that is my advice to you. Uh, beyond that, these are such incredibly unique times that I don't know that there is a solution to getting people to participate during a global pandemic that is even applicable once it's over. So just keep doing your best. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you other than to turn it into a positive. And I'll just say as an advisor to the current grant and um, this evening's closing session, we're going to have two grantees from Iowa uh, be on a panel along with a regional organization organizer and myself to talk about that very grant program. So you can hear some successes and challenges there as well. So yeah, again, no, no advice other than to celebrate what you do do in, in these interesting times. Thank you. That was the one question that I saw come through. So if anybody had one that I missed, please go ahead and put it back in the chat and Cindy can talk about that. I'm showing about 9.58. We're wrapping up around 10.05. So we've got a little bit of time for those of you who um, have any questions or comments that you'd like to talk to Cindy. I will say, <clears throat> I do see one uh, comment in the chat about like people talking to each other, which is super cool. I really wish that we could do that like conference after the conference thing where people stand around and talk to each other and get really good ideas and sort of energize each other. I'm glad you all were able to do some version of that through the chat. So um, Marianne was talking to Stacy and talks about going beyond city borders in order to get people to participate and feel connected. And I'll say, I found a, a lot of success with that. We served like four really small um, farming towns, basically right around us in Columbus. And eventually I had the personal and professional confidence build to a point where I was not comfortable, but willing to go present at some of their annual village council meetings just to talk about what was going on in Columbus, which is the place where everybody who lived in their small town went to like get gas and groceries and, you know, whatever they needed. It was the town center for their small municipalities. And 
I found the confidence through this process that I just talked to you about to sit in front of a village council I only saw once a once a year and answer their questions and hear their doubts <laughs> and some negativity come back at me. Um, but I shared beyond it. We talked to, to those small rural schools. Um, we really strove to connect beyond the confines of just our community. And sometimes that's that might be where you really find um, your, your good connection. So that was good advice in the chat. Let's see. Okay, I'm not seeing anything else come up in chat and um, Sam and Becky, I'll invite you to, I mean, I haven't been all the way through it. <laughs> oh, I just like the comment that came through her at the end. Um, library uh, bedroom community, still community oriented, sounds a lot like what you describe in Columbus um, and looking to build the library up in that, in that scenario. I think that that's- um, Oh yeah. Laura, we could talk for hours probably. It's a challenge. It is a challenge, but fake confidence. Fake confidence. Get it done. Yes. <laughs> That's what I had to do. Put, it, put your theater voice on, right, Becky? And That's and right. Down. Yep. Okay. Right. Fake well, it you make we, it. we can act confident, right? Even if we aren't. And then yeah. we're modeling it for those around us as well. And, and I'll say confident positivity kind of is, is the way to go. And I think that leading with yes gets a long way to that. If someone was to walk in and say, that park really is a mess. I mean, your gut reaction as a librarian is to be like, what do you want to book about parks? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, not my job. But yes, it is a mess. And let me tell you what we can do to help beautify our community with that. I think and consequently, is. our programming numbers in our annual report just skyrocketed because every time we took part in something like that, I counted all the people and I reported them. And that was, you know, a nerdy, but a, a way to um, have good news to share with those small municipalities and my own city council. Well, exactly. I mean, I just think it goes to show, you know, the library has stepped up and gotten more involved and the people are recognizing that too. So exactly. Someone sent a comment to the hosts here. We partner with parks, schools, churches, any organization that will have us. I think yes. that that's great because you. you can be that root of your community. It doesn't matter where you're kind of branching off to. So I think that that's really excellent advice. Becky, anything else you want to say? I just had one quick thing to, to throw in here. I've been doing a lot of strategic planning lately, and I have gotten some of that negativity from even some board members as well as community members yes. who say, that is not the library's job. Why are you guys going out into the park and you know organizing a cleanup day? Um, and so I think there were some really great ideas here and ways for a librarian to sort of come back with that. So I would encourage, I'm hoping that we have some trustees in the audience this morning. And so I would really encourage you guys to kind of think about this and what part you want to play in your community and um, make sure that that's part of your, your planning as you move forward. I think Cindy did a really great job of explaining all that to us. And then the other piece that I particularly like here as well is, um, you know, you mentioned, Cindy, that your job was to get out into the community and be at these different organizations, but then that you were specifically able to raise up leaders on your own staff to make sure that the library itself mm -hmm. was still visible and anchored. I've heard, you know, anecdotal feedback like, well, yeah, it's great the director's out there doing this, but then the staff feels a little bit unmoored. And so that as you're doing this, you're not ignoring your own staff and their direction as well and to specifically well, you support you can't assume you're going to be a director for life. Like for me, I stepped away and I started working for the state library and got to meet Sam. And um, that was a good change for me. But because staff felt empowered and were viewed as leaders themselves, um, the, the folks who, you know, remained after I left, I would like to think that some of that impetus sort of kept them going into the future. <laughs> 